Well, hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium, the home of the Cherries. Now we're back for another special episode as we look to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club. For those who are new to our podcast, my name's Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. Today, I'm reunited with the one and only Neil Perrett, who's been covering the club for over 30 years. Neil, it's great to see you and great to be back competing in the Premier League. Back where we want to be, isn't it? After five years, 2015-2020, great start by beating Aston Villa, three tough games after that. But yeah, it's great to be back and what, what a great guest we've got today. Absolutely. As you say, a really exciting guest today. And I just know you're all going to enjoy hearing from him on our podcast. He only joined the club in January and might have made fewer than 10 appearances. But my Lord, what an impact he's had. Not only did his goal against Nottingham Forest send us to the Premier League, he's gone on to score on his top flight debut just two days before his 30th birthday, making it four in six for the Cherries. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Kiefer Moore onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Kiefer, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. So just before we start, I'd like to ask you about the Junior Cherries Open training session which took place early this month. What was it like to be involved in that? It must have been great to see all those smiling faces. Yeah, it was really good. You know, I think in, in football, you've got to enjoy those experiences because, you know, kids will come away from that loving it. And um, yeah, it's, all, it's always nice to have people watching training as well. Typical that it would, first time it would rain for months and months as well. Oh yeah, it was heavy rain as well. <laughs> Now, we're going to take you back to the very, very start. Kiefer Roberto Francisco Moore was born in Torquay in August 1992. We know that you were named after Kiefer Sutherland, the British and Canadian actor. Tell us about those two other names. Where did, where did they come about? Um, so I had a, an uncle. Um, he sadly passed away when he was very young. So um, his middle names were Roberto Francisco. So um, uh, my mum wanted to you know, keep that go in and keep the spirit of my uh, uncle alive so she give she passed it on to myself and who who was the um where did Kiefer come from was that mum or dad were they a fan of Kiefer Sutherland you know what I'm not I'm not really sure I just I think I do remember my mum maybe saying like it was from Kiefer Sutherland but then kind of thinking looking back I don't know how old he would have been then or so I'm, I'm not particularly sure but I think you know my my brother's name's Astin my sister's name's Natalia um, so we've got quite extravagant names, I'd I uh, say. After what you've done here, we're going to have mums and dads are going to be naming their kids <laughs> Kiefer, I think, after you. <laughs> anyway, back to it. Neil now used to regularly holiday in Torquay. He had his own bar stool, I believe, at the Palace Hotel until it got demolished. Now tell us about your upbringing on the English Riviera, to put it in Neil's words. Yeah, it was amazing. You know, I was I had a, had a great childhood, you know. Um, very fortunate to to live down there. There's there's next to no crime. Um, if you're quite like an outdoorsy person or you you love to be out and about, it's it's perfect. There's I wouldn't say there's that much to do when you when you grow up, but as a, as a kid, it's it's everything you wish and, and more. You can go down, jump in the sea. You just it's it's got everything. And tell us about how you found your way into the Torquay youth ranks. Um, so I was playing local football um, at that point um, and it was, so I played for like the, I think it was the county um, just before that and um, I got the uh, trial um, for the, uh, I think it was cent- Centre of Excellence at that time. Um, so yeah, obviously I would, didn't turn it down, went there and um yeah, so from from that point, it was I wasn't there long, but um, at that point they disbanded their their youth system because I think they may have got relegated. I think it was at that some point, so they just cut everything off. As you say, they did. They they got rid of their youth system when you were twelve. How did that affect you at the time? Um, I do you know what? I don't think it really affected me that much because I was I was very new to it and I hadn't really experienced it properly I would say um so I kind of just went back playing you know f- normal football football with my friends and you know I got I got a lot of enjoyment out of that I, you know I loved playing playing football but it was um yeah I, I would say maybe it, it took some enjoyment from it obviously 
the realization like further like down the line but um yeah at that point i don't think it really hit you went to combine your footballing you were attending south devon college just tell us what you studied there and your best and worst subjects at school <laughs> Um, so yeah, South Devon College, we studied, it was, a, I think it was like an MVQ or it was like a diploma in sport or something like that. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, I actually really enjoyed my time at college. You know, it, it opened my eyes. Obviously it was, it was almost like a gateway to, um, I wouldn't say like academy football, but it was also almost like we were, we, you know, it was an academy. We were playing football training in the mornings, then going to the college after. Um, but yeah, it's kind of opened my eyes to like what how how football is kind of running in that kind of sense. But um, now nah, college 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 was enjoyable. Um, I'd say my worst subject. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. Maybe, maybe science, um, and then best it's either P art or mass arts an interesting one have you done any art since uh not really since like i do i would love to you know get back to it but my um yeah my sister's an illustrator as well um so i think it's just maybe something that's in the family now you had a lot of part-time jobs when you were when you were a kid when you were younger a teenager i would imagine just not very many Premier League footballers work in a sweet shop. Tell us a little bit about that. How did that one come about? Um, yeah, so I was, I think I was just still in college at that time. So it was kind of more like a a summer job, you know, get a little bit of money so we can, um, you know, fund some activities, if you can say that. Um, but yeah, so I think I ended up going for an interview. There was, I think they just opened, it was probably one of the first ones maybe in uh, Payton at that time to to really open up something like that. So it was quite new to everyone. So um, yeah, ended up getting the job. I don't think I was, I was just there for the summer months, but um, yeah, I think I was there for maybe f- three months, but yeah, it was, it was quite uh, like looking back. Yeah, it was, it was quite fun. Like, you know, I guess it's, I guess it's hard work at the same point, but you know, going, going to the back, like whilst, um, it's not really that busy and eating some sweets in the warehouse and then coming back on the front, making a making a milkshake and <laughs> just going about my day there. Now, I do know that washing dishes in a restaurant is hard work because I've done that and you did that in a restaurant in Paynton. So was that like a promotion almost? Uh, yeah, you could say that. To be fair, I think I had that alongside doing the, the sweet shop. So... Um, yeah, that was that was always hard work. I I wouldn't say I particularly enjoyed that because I was in the kitchen and the kitchens are unbearably hot and yeah, it's, it's a very stuffy environment. <laughs> and then a storeman at Bright House, the Torquay branch of Bright House. That was hard work as well, I would imagine. Yeah, so yeah, I've, I've been and done everything really. It's um yeah, it was a you know what? I actually really enjoyed my, you know, experiences and you know, look looking back now, you don't think many footballers have, have well hardly any I've done what I've done and you know I think it makes me you know appreciate everything I've I've managed to do in in my career now you were a prolific goal scorer for Paynton Saints in the Devon League we, we, we've read that and you got spotted by Truro City now their director of football at the time was a guy called Steve Massey who was a striker at AFC Bournemouth in the late late 90s early 80s oh, I think you only very briefly crossed paths with him. Is that correct? Yeah. So I don't think I really met. I can't. I can't really remember. To be fair, but um, touching back on that, my actually gateway into that was um, obviously South Devon College. We had a a coach who was at that time the assistant at Truro City. So he um, asked me to come down for a trial. I think it was just. This was like a couple of years later, off the off chance, um, if if I wanted to come and you know just trial out, see see what it was about, and I ended up doing really well there. And then yeah, here I am now. <laughs> now at Truro, you combined your time there with working full time as a personal trainer and a lifeguard at Devon Hills Holiday Park. Now tell us just a little bit more about that experience. Did you ever have to save anyone's life or any dramatic stories from that time there? 
No, thankfully not. Um, no, nah, um, it's a relatively quiet um, swimming pool, sl- uh, like gym. Um, so there wasn't too much going on, thankfully. Um, it's it can be a long, long-winded job. Um, you know, being on on poolside, it, it gets very hot. So, <laughs> as you can imagine, just watching people swim over and over, it's um, it's quite draining. <laughs> I believe you used to travel two hours on the train to get to Truro for training. Is that is that true? Yeah. So um, I think our schedule was maybe like train on a Tuesday or train on a Thursday. Um, sometimes I couldn't do it due to like work commitments. But um, yeah, if I was to uh, train it, uh, it would be I'd have to either get the train to Truro or one of the lads uh, that lived in Exeter. Um, I travel in with him, so yeah, it was it was hard as you can imagine. Like uh, I think at that point I was working maybe mornings, so I think I'd be getting up at maybe five o'clock, um, getting into the gym about quarter past six on some days to open up, and then I'd maybe finish about three o'clock. Um, in in that meantime, I'd I'd have to do like um, I'd make sure I'd do a workout for myself, and then um, get a little bit of rest, and then I'd I'd go to training. Yeah, so it's uh, quite a full on if you if you look back and at that. The, the the dedication and hard work very early got you a move to firstly Dorchester, and then into the championship with Yeovil Town in July, twenty thirteen. Was that the break that you had craved into the championship with them? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, that was you know was, I enjoyed my time there. I felt like I learned a lot about myself and and football in general. That was my first proper experience of you know full time professional football because we went obviously full time at the other the other clubs. Um, but yeah, it was that was that was what I wanted. That's what I worked you know relentlessly hard for. And when that opportunity came about, I was you know obviously made up. I initially went um, to trial there, and I was I did have uh, trials um, that I was going to go to after. But I think you know as soon as I went there, I knew that this was this was the platform I wanted to play. At. After the Oval, they got relegated to League Two. Eventually, I think you went to Norway with Viking. I've read that you said this was a challenging period of your career. Can you expand on why that was challenging? Yeah, as you can imagine, moving to a, a foreign country on your on your own um, is was tough. Um, I wouldn't say there was a like a language barrier, but it was you know you'd you'd be in I don't know the canteen or you'd be just in and around the changing room, and sometimes it'd flicker into English, sometimes it'd flicker into Norwegian, and I didn't feel like I could really be myself. I couldn't really get involved how, how I'd like to. Um, in that sense but I think I learned a lot about football um, over there you know it's a different style of playing a different you know culture Um, but it was one I you know I wanted to to take and you know I didn't really have the impact I wanted to I was very limited to minutes on the on the pitch I think I only made off the top of my head 11 appearances maybe um, with one start and so I come away from there um, a bit, uh, well, really disappointed in myself of that I didn't manage to get what I wanted from from that. But um, yeah, I think it kind of after that really kickstarted something in myself saying I wanted I wanted more from it. So that's interesting. It sounds like a low point. You've made a high out of a low point because you you had a few trials after coming back from Norway. Was was there ever a stage where you thought, well, I'm not going to get back into a decent level here? Were you worried? I wouldn't necessarily say I'm worried, but um, you know, it's it's always um, it's always hard um, once you've had you know a taste of you know going playing in the championship. There was some some big teams at that at that point in, in that league and making my debut at uh, Sheffield, like competitive debut, Sheffield Wednesday away in front of like 25,000. And um, yeah, it was amazing. So to, to think of those moments and then to think of the point where I was coming back into England after 
having an unsuccessful time in abroad um, was hard. But I think deep down I knew I just needed a platform. Um, so I did have trials at um, Leighton Orient, maybe. Uh, I think I also had a trial at Exeter and they offered me a contract, but um, I chose to go with uh, Forest Green instead. As you say, you did go with Forest Green in the National League. You helped them reach the playoff final, but you didn't feature because I believe you ruptured your appendix after the second leg. Yeah, so yeah, there's another twist in my story. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously having the, the the highs of getting to Wembley um, after the we won the semi-final, um, I had a really sharp pain in my stomach. Um, I was thinking this doesn't this doesn't feel right. Ended up. Um, just kind of making it through the night and then we got back to the place and I just couldn't settle in bed it was just relentless I think I, I left it till maybe didn't sleep a wink like left it till maybe eight o'clock in the morning and I thought something's not right here like I haven't slept one second um, took myself to A&E and yeah they said if I kind of left it any longer my um, appendix would have ruptured and obviously that's never never good because that can be quite deadly um, but yeah so obviously to go through that and then to miss um, the big occasion at Wembley and obviously I was losing at Wembley as well so it's a double kick in the teeth really. <laughs> well shortly after yeah. you went on loan to Torquay 2016-17 season how good was it for you to play for your hometown club and how much did you enjoy it? Yeah amazing um, you know I've had so many fond memories of of that and you know, I only can really thank the the manager Kev, Kev Nicholson he he really helped me with that you know he he really believed in me he wanted to get the best out of me and and I think at that time um going to play for Torquay um in front of my family you know all my friends um was really what I needed um and that I think that really kick-started everything um I enjoyed myself, I enjoyed going to training, I enjoyed playing the games, you know, obviously growing up as, you know, I was a Torquay fan, um, to actually finally get the chance, as I thought, you know, I'd, I'd never get that chance, I thought I missed it um, as a kid. To play for Torquay was, was special and I did really enjoy my time there. You scored five goals in four games, which probably says how much you enjoyed it, I think one of those was a, a hat-trick in there as well. Would you have liked to stay longer? Uh, yeah, so that was, you know, that was the initial um, talks after I finished the loan spell um, was for me to maybe go there permanently, but uh, Ipswich Town um, obviously come calling and when a, when a team like that comes calling, you, you don't, or you've got an answer and that answer's always yes. So um, that was the opportunity I was, I was longing for to be to go back up the, the footballing pyramid and I was, you know, very thankful for that. So just going back to Torquay, if you were a tour guide in Torquay, where's the one place that you would introduce people to? Oh, in, in what sense? Well, if you were a tour guide and you had a coach load of people and you wanted to impress them, would it be somewhere like Anstey's Cove or, I, I don't know, somewhere like that maybe? That's a tough question. Um, maybe Meadfoot. Meadfoot's quite nice. Um, Maybe be Ilsham Marine Drive. There's some lovely houses along there. So maybe, yeah, somewhere like that. Nice, nice. I'll have to look <laughs> at those. Now, it was a very eventful Christmas for you that year. Uh, you featured for Forest Green in an eventual double header against Torquay. Games finishing 4-3 and 5-5. And as you said, Ipswich came along, then in the championship. Just want to ask you about one player you played alongside at Ipswich, Brett Pittman. Cherry's legend here. Yeah. And his podcast can be listened on all of our channels. Oh, nice. Tell us about playing a game with him. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it was really eye-opening when I, when I went to it. It's, it was, I felt like it was a calibre above of what I'd been um, at that point, I've had seen really. Um, it was only really in, in training mm -hmm. and, and the drills that I could really see, you know, these, these players were the, the real deal, like um, first, you know, watching Brett in the finishing drills, it was it was goal after goal, and the technique was always was always there. And he's he a very good natural finisher, and it was just seemed seamless for him. 
So I took, you know, inspiration from that and it was how how can I get myself to that point of where I, I looked like that and I was that, you know, competent in front of goal and so yeah, it was it was really good and you know, he's a I said it before, but he's yeah, he was a great finisher. Now, it was quite a short spell at Ipswich. It was 11 substitute appearances in total before a six-month stay at Rotherham. He got 13 goals in 19 starts and another move back to the Championship with Barnsley. Was there, was there ever a stage where you thought maybe the Championship might just be, I might not get higher than that, Barnsley, you know, you Yeovil and Ipswich? No, not at all. Um, I think my, my thinking behind it, uh, the loan spell, was I had a really good pre-season. Um, I think that that off season I had probably the best off season I've I've ever had. So I come back super fit um, for Ipswich, and I I was I felt different in myself. I felt like this this was my time. If I wasn't going to play here, I was certain I had to I had to play somewhere. And you know, uh, Rotherham come calling and you know speaking to the Paul Warren over the phone. It was that was it. I could. I just had that feeling of this is this is where I'm gonna really showcase my stuff. Um, so I took you know my confidence and everything I've been working on there, and yeah, I could just I just had that feeling. It's it's hard to describe, but the feeling was that mm-hmm. I'd I'd be successful here, and um, yeah. So I started house on fire, and you know it was re- it was I loved playing under Paul Warren. It was it was great and. Yeah, I felt that that was at that point in time was was what I needed, and then obviously to then Barnsley come in, um, the the step back to the championship, I felt that come at the the perfect time. I felt ready in myself. Um, obviously, the team um, was struggling at the time. You know, I think Paul Heckenbottom at the time signed me, and then maybe it was a week or two later he signed for Leeds. Um, so that was always a tough transition, but you know I was thankful to be back in the championship, and I think I to get that taste of it again really, really helped. Now, when you were at Barnsley, I just want to ask you about a certain incident. You might know what's coming. You fractured your skull playing for them against Gillingham. It was February 2019, and I know previously you've described that incident as horrendous. Did it change your perspective on things? Because it must have been awful to to go through. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't nice, um, but it did massively change my perspective. Um, I think maybe since that point, I've been a lot more ruthless and quite direct with my decisions. Um, I feel like that kind of really opened my eyes to what I wanted to achieve from from my career. And at that point, you're almost you know, at a standstill, you know, I was obviously recovering from, from that incident and I was watching the games and, you know, thinking like, I'd, I'd love to, you know, take part and, and what I what I really, really wanted to do. And it was difficult. It was, yeah, it was super difficult, um, you know, having to see specialist after specialist after specialist to finally say, you're now fit and able to play. Um, but yeah, there was some, some, some scares along the way. Um, but you know, as soon as I got that that yes to play, it was it was a change in my mind. It was like a switch. It was just back to to full on relentlessness, and it was I was ready to go. And obviously, coming on for the first time after it was was quite daunting, but it was super exciting. Um, but as you can imagine, um, the first phase was actually a goal kick that was being kicked up to me just as soon as I come on. So. Um, Obviously, you can imagine all the emotions running through my head, like, oh, my God, what happens if it happens again? Um, but I said to myself at that point, it was either I I let this take control of my mind or I, I take control of it and um, I just give it everything. I, f- I felt like I had to be 100% in it or I was never going to be the, the same player or have the impact I'd want to have. So, you know, I went and won the header and yeah, it was that was the end of that. Well, an impact you certainly had. The 2018-19 season was certainly a memorable one for you. You were named in the PFA Team of the Season after scoring 19 goals and you 
earned a call up, your first call up to the Wales squad. Was this lift off for Kiefer Moore? Yeah, definitely. This was, you know, I was finally found my feet and I was ready to, you know, to really make my, my way up and to really assert myself and, you know, to, to show people that what I could really do. Um, so the, yeah, the international call up was, you know, it was amazing. You know, it was, for me, that was kind of a reward for all the hard work I've been putting in, all the endless hours, all the stuff people don't see behind closed doors. That was, that was it. And then to finally make my, my debut for Wales um, was amazing. And then the competitive debut was, was amazing to, against Slovakia away. Obviously, it was a qualifier for the Euros. Um, to score was, yeah, something special. We'll certainly come on to the international stage later on. But just clear up for us your links with China because it's well known and there's, there's stories written out there that you could have potentially played for China. Can you just clear that, that up for those that are listening? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I have Chinese heritage in my family. So um, there was talks and about me um, going out to play for a team in China. Um, you know, it got quite far down the line, but the the whole kind of, you know, appeal of it was to to represent the national team. I think they were naturalising players at that point. Um, a good example was maybe Nico Yunaris, who moved from Brentford to Beijing. Um, so the, the, obviously the idea was to improve the national side so they could compete in, you know, major tournaments. Um, so, yeah, so there was, there was talks about that and... You know, as if you speak to my partner, she 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 didn't want to entertain it. Obviously, moving to China is a completely different lifestyle, and as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, sometimes uh, you've got to make those hard decisions. But you know, it was it was it was tough because obviously you can imagine it was quite a lucrative lucrative offer, and um, at that point, I think I was just coming out of Barnsley um, but yeah um, my mind was always you know set on playing for Wales because at this point I already been to maybe two two camps and it would have taken a lot for me to, to come away from that So instead of Beijing you ended up in Wigan Yeah <laughs> that's uh, quite the transition yeah <laughs> No, you had, a, you had a season at Wigan and you suffered rele- relegation through no fault of the team's own. We've been through it all here. Points deduction sent the cherries down many years ago. Must have been a really bitter pill for everybody, that one. It was, but um, <clears throat> I don't. it didn't feel like that. I felt like what we, I'm going to say, what we achieved at that club during that, during that spell was, was remarkable. You know, um, I look back at that that moment and I think like what a group of lads staff management we had because you know at that point we you know we weren't getting paid um there was big obviously implications and everything surrounding the football club there was negativity all around us and but one thing that that stood strong was was everyone inside the the football club um the unity that everyone shown and the passion for to try and get this club out of such a dire situation was was amazing and um to say I was part of that was is amazing and yeah this obviously I think we maybe went down by a point in the end I think it may have been um but we went on some some run and you know beat some beat some good sides you know obviously I think we we were seven nil up at Hull at half time and on and one of the games so um yeah it was that was that was tough obviously being being part of it but it was, at the same time it was it was amazing people got this misconception that all footballers are rich and stuff like that and you've just touched on it there you weren't getting paid what was that like yeah obviously it's it's um as you can imagine it's it's never nice not getting um paid for a job you're you're doing but um yeah we we knew what what to expect um as soon as the club got into administration, it was, um, you know, that was probably the one of like, the first things you get told is that you're not going to, you know, be getting your money and, and whatnot. But, you know, thankfully everyone was, you know, set for, for such an event. Um, 
but um, yeah, it's, it's never nice. But what what can happen to teams, you know, where, if, for instance, I don't really know. Uh, mm -hmm. You kind of, you know, come away from feeling like, oh, they're not paying me. I don't, I don't want to play. Um, we had none of that. We had a great team, great staff, and everyone was really more involved. I think after that is, I think they really wanted to to dig and help the club out. One of your highlights of that season must have been getting to know Jamal Lowe, someone you played alongside for the whole season. Now, we know he's one of the best dressed players in the changing room here. <laughs> How would you describe your dress sense? Yeah, I'd like to think my, my dress sense is good. Um, yeah, I've got a wide variety of clothes. I like to, you know, mix it up. I could sometimes be smart, sometimes casual. Um, yeah, I wouldn't definitely say I'm I'm the worst dressed. I would say I'm I'm a very consistent, nice dresser. Let's put it that way. <laughs> a lot has been made of the gaffer's dress. What are you wearing to games? What on earth was he doing wearing a cardigan on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might have been fairly hot in that, but I don't know if he was in the shade maybe. But um, yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of talk around the the gaffer's gear, but you know I'm I I enjoy the gaffer's gear. I, I think some of it's quite nice, yeah. Now, 2020-21, you became the first Cardiff City player to score 20 league goals in more than a decade. We think the penalty against the Cherries was a bit harsh, though, Diego Rico's tackle on Perry NG. <laughs> do you remember that? I do remember that, yeah. And I, I remember the penalty as well. Stuck it right in the top corner. <laughs> when you left Cardiff for AFC Bournemouth in January earlier this year. You described your time as well in Wales as really special. What was it that brought you to the South Coast? Um, my aspirations to, to play in the Premier League. Um, you know, I, had, I held talks with the club and it was, it was everything I wanted to hear. And, um, you know, I've, I've never shied away from saying I, I always want to play in the highest league possible. And, and I saw this as as my chance. Obviously, having a failed, um, you know, transfer to Wolves um, obviously didn't didn't pan out. But as you can imagine, on on someone that's had a you know a failed Premier League move, it's it's quite hard. And sometimes it does does affect you in certain ways that you wouldn't think it did. Um, I'm not saying it affected me, but I, you know, at that point, what what more could I have done to you know? to maybe cement that Premier League um, aspiration of mine. Um, so as soon as um, Bournemouth come calling, um, obviously haven't played against them in the, in the season, only I knew what a great side they were. And um, I felt like I could, I could be, you know, the factor to help them get to the Premier League. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk about your brief time with the Cherries. I don't know about you, Neil, but there's not that much to talk about, is there? I can't think of any more questions. <laughs> so we just cancel it all now, bring it to an end? <laughs> now, there is one place that we do want to start and that's after you just arrived. Obviously, you come on as a substitute and you break your foot. What a horrible start that must have been for you. Yeah, it was, it was mental. Um, I didn't really know like what happened. I just obviously come on, made my debut, I was, you know, happy to, to finally be, you know, coming on, making appearances and to, to feel a part of it. And then as soon as the, the final whistle kind of went, I felt like uh, I was walking in down the tunnel and I just felt like, oh, my foot, my foot doesn't feel right. Um, didn't feel it at all during the game. So I ended up um, sitting down on the, just in the, in the changing room. Um, Gaffer had his team talk, um, gone to stand up. I could barely put any weight on it. Um, I was thinking like, what's going on here? Like I've just just ran around for, I don't know, maybe it was like six, seven minutes. Um, sat back down, couldn't couldn't move. Um, hobbled into the, uh, the physio room. I said, oh, my foot's killing me. Like, I don't know what I've done. Um, they did some checks, went, um, had a kind of an inkling what what potentially it could be, um, like, but they didn't think anything it was going to be any, anything too serious because there was no kind of significant moment that anything really happened. Um, so ended up, you know, having a scan uh, the day later, and yeah, 
it had broken my fifth metatarsal and um, it was a one where I had to have surgery as well. So, yeah, it's uh, never, never good on your home debut. <laughs> now, you certainly made up for lost time. Ten weeks on the sidelines. You headed back over the Seven Bridge and played a not insignificant role in a quite remarkable 3-3 draw with Swansea. How pleasing was it for an ex-Cardiff player to score twice against the Jacks? <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was amazing. Um, you know, I remember coming on to all the boos and I'm not going to lie, I, I love stuff like that. Um, that really spurs me on so I can, I, can, I can thank them for giving me an extra boost of motivation for that game. Um, but no, it was, it was amazing, you know, sitting out for, I think maybe it was 10, 10 weeks. I had a lot to think about um, and I really wanted to, you know, come back and, and make an impact and as soon as I f felt you know able in myself and my foot felt like I could I could have that impact I was I was ready to go I was eager to play I was trying to do everything I possibly could to to get into a situation where I could help the team because I felt from watching from the out the outside I felt like I could have you know the impact I did eventually have um, but it was yeah to to go there and score two goals and you know, to be part of that and, you know, that point was massive for us and, yeah, it was was amazing. Now, Zoe and I are both dog lovers. What about you? You got any pets or have you had in the past or...? Yeah, through, throughout my throughout my life, I've we've had dogs as a family. I um, absolutely love dogs. Um, I've got a dog, me and my partner at the minute. Um, I've got a dog called uh, Bella. So got a quiz question for you now why are Swansea fans known as Jacks do you know the answer to this one um, and it is dog related I actually don't know to you so a famous dog which was called Swansea Jack rescued 27 people from the docks and riverbanks of Swansea every day is a school day on the AFC Bournemouth podcast oh wow nice now a week after Swansea we hosted Nottingham Forest here just Give us a bit of an insight into the mood in the camp leading up to that one. Obviously, everyone knew what was on the line. Yeah, it was, for me, it was exciting. Um, you know, to have this opportunity, it was, you know, it was, I felt like it was all or nothing. Um, to get yourself into a position to say, you beat this team, you go up, is, is incredible. Um, so I think everyone knew what the what the score was, what what we had to do, what we, you know, what the lads have been working relentlessly hard throughout the whole season for, and everything was defined on this this game. Um, so as you can imagine, there was you know there's a lot of lot of pressure, but it was it was good pressure. It was pressure we needed to 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 come out on top. Um, so training was intense. Everyone was at it, and it was I would say the build up was was great, and you know to to come away winning that game and to realise, you know, plenty of lads' dreams of, you know, playing in the Premier League and a lot of them have already played in the Premier League, but um, it's amazing. Yeah, it was truly outstanding. Those eyes from Philip Billing that he gave <laughs> you when he was stood over that free kick, obviously after the game, the gaffer said it wasn't rehearsed, you said it's not been rehearsed, Keith, uh, Phil said it's not been rehearsed. Just talk us through the whole move from, from your point of view. Obviously, you get that glance. Were you confident that he was going to give it to you or did you still think, oh, he's going to have a go here? No, nah, as soon as I saw the the wall set up, I saw they had one extra man outside the wall, but Dom was there. Um, I just thought there's no point putting myself in there. So I took a couple of steps back, realised no one followed me, took another couple of steps. And then at this point, I was... I think I was shouting Phil. Uh, I was almost making hand signals so he could see me. I was like waving for the ball. Um, and as soon as he looked up and saw how much space I had, and um, obviously we, lock, we locked eyes, I think at that, at that moment, I knew he was going to pass it. I, I didn't have any other thought in my mind that he wasn't going to not pass it to me. So I just you know, set my, set my body position in a shape of where I wanted to put the ball. Um, and you know it was a it was a great ball into me, and all I had to do was you know all I wanted was hit it hard and hard and low, fast and early, so the the goalkeeper would be surprised of it, and you know 
I executed that and, you know, lo and behold, I scored the goal. So, yeah, it was uh, unbelievable. If it's not too personal, you dedicated that goal to your granddad. Just tell us about that. Yeah, so my granddad passed away in um, late January, just just before the move, I think. Or just maybe, yeah, just before the move. Um, yeah, so that was that was always hard. That was a tough one to to swallow, you know, family or distraught. But it's, you know, I felt like I had someone up there looking looking down on me and I, I really wanted to to do it for my granddad, you know, obviously that and alongside that, you know, um, getting Wales to the World Cup, I really wanted to do that. And um, to say I've, I've done that in, in honour of my granddad is amazing. You've spoken about how important and massive your family are. You've spoken about the support from your dad, Darren, mum, Lisa, and your partner, Charlotte. We saw some lovely pictures of you proposing to her in the summer. Just tell us about, I know she's been with you most of the journey as well. Just tell us about how, how important they have been to you. Must have been a lot of downs as well as ups. Yeah, so, yeah, obviously, I'm a big, big family man. I um, feel like that's, that's the, a, a big focus of mine is, you know, I love being around my family. Our family's huge for me, and everything I kind of do is is mainly based around you know that aspect of my life. And yeah, my my partner's really been through thick and thin with me. She's she's been there the the whole journey. Um, so she's seen everything. She's seen the ups, the downs, even more ups, even more downs. Um, but you know, out of everything, she's always she's been there for me she's been a rock and you know I don't think I would have got to this point without her um so the stuff that she's helped me through sometimes even just just being there being a be a face to talk to someone to, to you know to lift my mood um yeah it was no I can't can't thank Charlotte enough for that <laughs> now before we move on to this season with the cherries you've spoken about how much it meant to you to reach the World Cup with Wales. Can you just expand on that a little bit? It was amazing. Um, you know, the to say, you know, people people say it's such a small nation and that we shouldn't be, you know, competing in these big tournaments to to, to do it, you know, on the back of being at the Euros to then qualify for the World Cup is is amazing and, you know, if you can speak to anyone in Wales that's that's all anyone's talking about is the World Cup, and you know to say to say we did that for for such a great country is amazing, and you know to be part of that, part of the team that that did that is that will stick with me forever, and you know to for us to finally you know play in the World Cup and you know have the fans cheering us on all back at home or or anywhere even in front of the TV is going to be surreal. So, so you've got. America, Iran and England in your group, so second place will be up for grabs. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So I don't know where England are going to finish, but um, <laughs> um, no, nah, um, of course, it's it's going to be a, a great tournament. Um, yeah, I think you could only write it that, you know, England were going to be in our group or we're in their group, you know, either way you look at it. Um, but, you know, we, we know what to expect and you know, I think we'll we'll be going there to upset a lot of a lot of fans. Now it's two against two around this table because myself and James are English, and Zoe has to admit that she is a Wales fan. Yes. She resisted the temptation to wear her Wales shirt and her bucket hat, but she says, "Can you get me a couple of tickets for the final?" <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'll sort that. <laughs> now, back to the cherries. It was real Roy of the Rover stuff scoring on your Premier League debut against Aston Villa two days before your 30th birthday. Obviously, everyone has seen the Premier League anniversary. It was the Premier League's 30th anniversary as well recently. Did you ever imagine that day would come and could it have panned out more perfectly? Yeah, I think, you know, I've always pictured this day in my mind. I've, I believe in, in visualising um, outcomes and certain moments that I'd like to, to have in my life and... Um, so when when this moment really did come, um, I knew I was gonna take it. Um, you know, to 
you know, this was it was my first first start for the club as well. Um, obviously, due to the circumstances, but I really knew I'd I did I know I assert myself, and it, this this was the moment I've been waiting for for my whole career. This was everything leading up to this point. Um, I felt like all the hard work, everything I've been through, and everything I've you know I will go through was was for this point here and for me to for be playing in the Premier League this season and you know what what bigger occasion than to to score your first goal um in the Premier League and I always say it about multiple goals I've scored but um as soon as that that ball come in and I saw I was fairly free um I knew all I had to do was repeat a process I've I've done countless times in my career um and execute a, a finish that I've done on the training pitch many, many times. But right at the start of the season, but what are your hopes and goals for the rest of the campaign? Um, you know, I'm 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 a big believer in setting big goals. I have I have big ambitions and I've set um big targets I'd I'd like to achieve throughout the season. I'm not gonna say what they they are, but um they are ambitious. Just going back to Wales, a couple of lads in the changing room. You all, we're all hoping that Meps and Brooksy will go. Just how how great is it being to have Brooksy back on the training pitch? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, um, Brooksy's such a a big character and a great lad, and to have him back amongst everything is is amazing. And you know, he he's he's really enjoying it. You know, he's he's working hard to get back to the fitness he was, and you know, hopefully we'll see him back soon in a in a cherry ship. And in the same breath, let me ask you about Chris Mepham, his role in that Wales reach in the World Cup finals. Is, you, you can't take anything away from that either. Nah, not at all. Yeah, Meps is, Meps is an outstanding centre-half. And, you know, he's, I think he was vital to, to us achieving what we wanted to achieve. You know, some of the, some of the blocks, some of the clearances, some of the, some of the performance he's had drawing for uh, Wales has been second to none. And, you know, you only can see that in, you know, the games he's played for for Bournemouth, you know, the the game against Aston Villa, I thought it was amazing. Um, so, yeah, he's he's had such a pivotal role for for Wales over the years, and you know, longer may that continue. Now, before we start rounding off, one more question: All or nothing. We've seen it with Arsenal, we've seen it with Spurs, we've seen it with Man City. Would you be uh, Would you be up for seeing an AFC Bournemouth one out there anytime soon? Do you know what? I think it'd make a really good viewing um, to see the insights of of what we what we do each day is. Would be would be eye eye opening for a, for a lot of people. So yeah, I'd be I'd be keen for that. Maybe we could get Kiefer Sutherland in to play you. How would that go down with the family? They'd love that, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, tell you what. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> now we're going to come to some supporter questions in a moment, but we've okay. just got five quick fire questions for you. Favorite match? Uh, Forest. <laughs> Favorite goal? Forest. Favorite international moment? Scoring at the Euros. Toughest opponent? Oh, I don't know. Um, Not met him yet, maybe? Yeah, none that's really... <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Best player you have played with? Gareth Bell. Toughest opponent? Ah. Did you ever come up against Nathan Walker in training at Dorchester? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I've, I've I've played against some some very good centre halves, but I can't think where I've been. I've come away thinking, oh my god, that was it was amazing. We'll come back to that right at the end. I'll have a good think about that. <laughs> okay, we're nearly at the end, so you haven't got long. Okay, but cool. I am going to throw you some supporter questions. We put some messages out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook to you know so to allow supporters to ask you some questions that we might not have included. Um, Quite quick fire again. I'm going to ask you one from R A F C B. What do you think of your chant? Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't expect um, that, but um, yeah, it's you know every time you hear supporters singing your name is 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 amazing, and it gives me you know goosebumps every time I hear it, and you know it's it is quite catchy as well. <laughs> I'm from Callum, Messi or Ronaldo? Ronaldo. No hesitation. 
no hesitation at all. Rob wants to know how it feels to be the best thing to come out of Torquay since Forty Towers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take that, yes. Um, yeah, it's a good one to have, yeah. <laughs> Matt wants to know, when you walk on the pitch, you do a movement which almost looks like you throw something up in the air. Can you explain about that or what more specifically what that is? Yeah, so I, um, every time I, I step over the white line to play a game, um, for me it's about being you know grateful of of the opportunity I have at that present time and to really it kind of gets me in the zone and I'm, and I think about stuff I'm thankful for to before I play this game um, so I grab a piece of grass two touches of to my chest kiss the grass and throw it into the air <laughs> now we've had a lot of questions from men and women and they're asking why you're so sexy but you didn't win the sexiest player in the Premier League. That went to Jack Stacey. That must have been a bit of a shot in the eye for you. Yeah, that was a bit of a blow. Um, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, to be fair, I think Stacey's buzzing with that, by the way. Non-stop half and on about it. Right, well, we are at the end, so I'm still going to ask you for who your toughest opponent is. <laughs> I haven't forgotten there. All right. Um, for those who don't know when we're recording, we've just played Manchester City and Keith Moore sat here thinking about who his toughest yeah, opponent yeah, might true. have been. Yeah, that's a good one. But I felt like I didn't really... Like, ah... Uh, yeah, um... <laughs> I'll tell you what, maybe maybe back in the day, um, I'll, go, I'll go with one of them, even though I've played against some internationally renowned centre-halves. But at that point, I felt like it, he gave me a, good, a, a tough game. Um, was it McNulty at Tram, Tramere? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I remember playing against him, and yeah, he gave me a, a good go. <laughs> there we go. That's some accolade, that isn't it, Neil? Well, he's the guy. He always used to get ridiculed for for, for his appearance, didn't yeah. he? But like you said, he was a fearsome opponent, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's. Um, yeah, you know, he was he was quite a, a big guy, but he was he's very good in you know reading movements and and being quite aggressive as well. So there you go. Well, there we go, yeah. Kiefer. We've thoroughly enjoyed having you here on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Thank you for taking the time to come in and chat. We've had some brilliant stories and, and really enjoyed your company. Thank you. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we'd absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be really grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Kiefer Moore and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. <laughs>